I'm John Goldsmith, and this is the second part of a video that I'm doing on autosegmental phonology. And in this second part, I'll go through a few examples that illustrate how autosegmental phonology works. The first um, has to do with Nupe. It's from an article written by Isaac George back in the mid-1970s. The article is called Nupe Tonology. And what we see in Nupe here um, is a pretty common uh, phenomenon we find in a number of languages. And we'll skip right to the conclusion here. There's a, an autosegmental rule that has as its input a sequence of low and high associated with adjacent vowels uh, in that order. And those vowels are separated by a voiced consonant. In that case, when we find that case, um, we add an association line, or nupe adds an association line, between the L, the, the low tone, and the following vowel, the vowel that had been and con will continue to be, so to speak, associated with a high tone. Okay, So let's just see why one would want to say that. Um, uh, Isaac George points out that there are, we could say five, from a descriptive point of view, there are five tone patterns that can be found on a vowel. There's low, mid, and high. And then there are two contour tones. There's a rising tone and a falling tone. And using the um, conventions that are standard in uh, the study of African tone, we use an acute accent to mark a high tone, a grave accent to mark a low tone. A falling tone is represented by a high followed by a low, which is to say an acute followed by a grave or simply a circumflex. Okay, if we look at the um, the data presented on the right here. Nouns commonly begin with a vowel prefix. And again, this is very common in West African languages that are part of this family that used to be called kwa. Um, so the prefix can have a low or a mid tone. And if we look at the uh, examples given here, the following syllable, which is the stem, um, in the first five cases, we see it has low, mid, or high. In the second case, we've got voiceless consonants in between the first vowel and the second. And once again, we find that the second vowel has um, high, um, has a high tone in all these cases. The third set of data um, include forms where the prefix vowel is low in tone and the vowel, sorry, the consonant that separates the two vowel is voiced. And in these cases, we find not a high tone, but a rising tone. So the rising tone in these cases is a surface reflection of a low tone prefix followed by a high toned um, stem with an association line added that spreads, so to speak, spreads the tonal domain of the low on the prefix into the second vowel of the stem. And so this phenomenon can be described either in a sort of an SPE-ish, let's separate the, the structural condition from the structural change in this first formulation, or more naturally, in a notation um, that we use in autosegmental phonology, the dotted line represents the structural change, which is the addition in this case, the addition of an association line between the low and the second vowel. Uh, and that second vowel is associated with a high. So that's the first example then, which illustrates the way that contour tones arrives, arise um, in languages in which tone is autosegmentalized. The next example I'd like to look at comes from Kikuyu, which is a, a Bantu language spoken in Kenya. And the material I'm going to look at here um, is based on work done by Nick Clements, G.N. Clements. Some of the work that he did was done along with um, Kevin Ford. Um, let's take a look at the structure of just part of the finite verb in Kikuyu. It's very similar to the structure of the verb in other Bantu languages that you may have encountered. Here I'm just going to actually focus on a couple of the positions in the verb. The subject marker, here I'll look at two examples, tu, which is the first person plural marker, and ma, the third person plural marker. These each represent one of the two tonal possibilities. I'm not going to tell you now whether they're high or low because that's part of the story, but these are just the two possibilities um, 
the, so each morpheme that can appear in the subject marker, and there are nearly two dozen of them, will either act like tu or act like ma from a tonal point of view. We can say the same thing for the object marker, marker position, and here we'll look at ma, mo, and ma. These are the third person singular and the third person plural. Bantu is called third, third person singular class one and third person plural uh, class two. If you're a Bantuist, that's what we're looking at. Um, and there are two possibilities, two tonal possibilities for each of the morphemes, and mo and ma represent the tonal characteristics um, of those two classes. Um, there are two kinds of roots from a tonal point of view as well, and tone represents one kind, it, it means send, and ro represents the other, look at. And lingu uh, Bantuists call the final morpheme in a, in a finite vowel, a finite rep the final vowel, and here the final the vowel is not just a vowel, in, in fact, I, R, I, I, um, but we'll call it a final vowel nonetheless. So this is the structure of the verb that we're going to take a look at. So when we look at nine, we see the different possibilities that we get from making choices out of these, the columns and the Kikuya verb. So if you look at them, I'm, I'm not going to read all of them with you. But um, take a look at the very first one here, tororire. So we've got low tones and high tones indicated by the grave and accent, uh, grave and acute accent, respectively. Um, on the first column, we've got the subject um, to in every case, which marks we, first person plural. The, um, the forms on the right have the subject um, marker ma, or for they, um, class two, third person plural. Okay, um, the the group on top, the the first three rows have the root, have the root roar. The um, th fourth, fifth, and sixth rows have the stem, or the root rather, tom. And each column, each of these rows, um, has one form without any object marker. That's the first one. So tororide. So to is a subject marker followed by a verb uh, root followed by the final vowel ire. The second and third have an object marker, mo and ma. So that's how we get all these possibilities. Tu and ma are the first column and second column. Mo and ma are the second and third row and fifth and sixth row. And then the two roots correspond to the top group and the bottom group. And we've got all the possibilities. Well, you can look through them here but I've um, made life easy for us. I've just put it all in a chart. So let's turn to the tones in the chart. Now, what do we see when we look at the tones in the chart? Let's first take a look at how it's organized. The left-hand side has the low subject markers. The right-hand side has the high subject markers. If we look at the first tone of all of the six forms on the left, they're all low. And the six forms on the right, they're all high. So it's perfectly clear the first tone of each word is determined by the subject marker, which is the first morpheme. Some are low, some are high. Well, the first row is different from the second and third in each of these groups of four, because in the first row, we've chosen not to have any object marker at all. In the second and third, we've got um, We've got the choice of the object marker from one class, tonal class, and from the other tonal class. We'll get to that in a second. Um, the third column uh, illustrates or presents the tone on the verb root. And then the, uh, the last two tones, which right here are low high, um, and they can be either low high or high high, those represent the tones on the two syllable, the final vowel, that is to say, ire. Okay. So let's look a little bit further. What tone do we see on the object marker when there is one? Well, we can see on the left-hand side, it's low, low, and low, low. So it's always low on the left, and on the right, it's always high. Well, since we know the left has a subject marker that's low, and on the right, we have the subject marker that's high, we can see when there is an object marker, it takes on the same tone as the subject marker. Okay, fine, so we're done with that. Now we turn to the tone of the root, and we see low, low, high, low, low, high on the left side, and um, high, low, high, and high, low, high on the right side. 
So well, let's see. When there is no object marker, we've got a low in the first group, a low in the second, and over on the right, a high and a high. So we can see when there is no object marker, the verb root itself takes on the same tone as the subject marker. Okay, so we can just say that together. We can, there's something to summarize. Whatever the vowel is that follows the subject marker, whether it's an object marker or if it's a root, it takes on the same tone as the preceding subject marker. Okay. Well, what does the object, what does the verb root do, or what tone does it have when there is an object marker? On the left, it's low high, low high, and on the right, it's low high, low high. So it just depends which tonal group the object marker comes from. So the tone that appears on the root um, will be determined by the choice of the object marker if there is one. If there isn't an object marker, we've already seen, the tone on the root is the same as the tone on the subject marker. Okay, one, one more. Let's turn now to the first vowel of ide. The left-hand side, we've got low, 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 and then high, high, high. On the right, we've got low, 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 and then high, high, high. Well, what determines whether you're in the top group or in the second group? Well, it's just the um, choice of the root. So the tonal category of the root determines what the tone of the E will be in ire. And finally, what's the tone of the final syllable? Well, it's high all the way through. So. So summarizing this, what we see is that the, each morpheme determines what the tone of the next syllable is going to be. Wow. Well, let's represent that in a geometrical way. We begin by observing that each morpheme brings to the word a particular tone, either a low or a high. Among the subject markers, to and ma, we've got to is, brings low, ma brings high. Of the object markers, those like mo bring low, and those like ma bring high. Um, of the roots, some bring low, some high, and in the examples that we've looked at, tom brings high and ro brings low. And finally, the final vowel, ire, brings a high tone with it. But what we can say is, as we build the underlying, as we build the, the verb itself, um, it's the phonology that's responsible for associating the tones and the syllables. So the morphemes that we're studying have a consonantal and vocalic specification, so to or ma, and a tone as well, but they're on separate tiers and it's not the morphology so much as the phonology that's responsible for associating them. So let's take a look and see how that's done. And it's done by a rule that associates the first tone, that is the tone that's adjacent to the left boundary of the word, to the second syllable, which is indicated in the upper tier. And the dotted line or dashed line here indicates that the structural change of the rule is to add that association line. So the output the effect of this rule is, as you see below, the first tone of the word is associated to the second syllable. And that's all there is to say for the very, the very first step. So given the representation in 17, there is exactly one way in order to add the smallest number, that is to say the minimal number of association lines, in order to maximally satisfy the well-formative condition. So every vowel should be associated with at least one tone, and every tone with with one vowel. Um, there's only one way to do that with the smallest number of association lines. And so I've uh, indicated those representations in 19 and 20, and that's the result. The automatic addition of the smallest number of association lines needed in order to maximally uh, satisfy the well forming this condition. So what's going on here? What's going on in Kikuyu? And what does it have to do with autosegmental phonology? Well, what's going on is pretty clear. It's a case of syncopation, or in some extended sense. So syncopation, as you probably know, 
is a mismatch between the expected rhythm and the perceived rhythm. And what we're seeing here is a mismatch between the to expected tonal pattern and the perceived tonal, tonal pattern. So there's a tonal pattern which is defined by the sequence of morphemes that composes the word. And there's an expectation of how that should be realized. And it's an expectation both in a ph phonological sense and in a morphological sense. So from a phonological point of view, the expectation would be a one-to-one -one alignment of tones from left to right. From a morphological point of view, there's an expectation that a tone would be associated with a morpheme that it, uh, it, it is logically part of. Both of those expectations are not respected in Kikuyu. And instead, what one has is a shifting by one syllable's worth, which I'm calling syncopation. So what does this have to do with anything? I think what it has to do with is the meaning of an association line. I didn't understand this at all in the 70s. Uh, nobody was really talking about um, the relevant ideas. But really what's going on here, I think that association lines um, are the phonologist way of talking about entrainment um, or synchronization between separate tiers. So there's a, if we've got an autosegmental system with two or more tiers, there's a sense of time, there's an unrolling of time for each tier. And autosegmental representation is a calling out of the possibility of an unexpected association between segments on the separate tiers. And what are association lines? They are statements as to um, where in each signal there needs to be or there is an alignment as a temporal alignment between the signals on the different tiers. So the Kikuyu case is very naturally interpreted as a case of synchronization, sorry, of uh, syncopation between the tonal uh, tier on the one hand and the segmental or syllable tier on the other. Well, this brings this uh, particular video to a close and the next video, I will look at another example of a very interesting tonal system from among the Bantu languages, Tonka.